Hello, everyone, and welcome to this morning's keynote address by Juan Gabriel Vasquez titled Invention of Past Truths. This keynote address kicks off our conference titled Narrating Transitional Justice, History, Memory, Poetics, and Politics. This conference is hosted by the Confronting Atrocity Project and the Center for Human Rights and Restorative Justice at McMaster University with support from Illinois State University. My name is Jennifer Wallace. I am with the Center for Human Rights and Restorative Justice here at McMaster, and I am your host for this conference. So before we formally get started with welcome remarks from Dr. Bonnie Abawa and Dr. Pamela Sweat, I'm just going to briefly go over the features available to you in this webinar uh, and talk a bit about the ways you can actually participate in today's event. Uh, this information will be posted in the chat for reference shortly. Uh, so you can access closed captions by clicking the icon on your Zoom menu panel titled either closed caption or live transcript. Then you may toggle between show subtitle to view the closed captions and hide subtitle to turn them off. There will be time for Q&A at the end of the talk, so please feel free to use the chat function to pose your questions for our keynote speaker. Or if you would prefer to ask your questions verbally, please just let us know in the chat and we will ask you to unmute yourself when it's your turn to ask your question. Uh, as we do have so many wonderful attendees today uh, for our talk, we just ask that during the presentation, you turn off your video to ensure maximum bandwidth for everyone here today. Uh, but you may turn your video back on when asking questions during the Q&A period. Um, and just a final reminder, this event is being recorded and it will be made available on the Center for Human Rights and Restorative Justice YouTube page at the close of the conference. So with that, I will pass things over to Bonnie Abawa to formally introduce today's event and get our conference off to a good start. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And uh, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome everyone to this conference. My name is Bonnie Irawa. I am the director of McMaster's Center for Human Rights and Restorative Justice, uh, one of the conveners of this conference. As is the custom here in Canada, I would like to begin with the land uh, acknowledgement. Uh, although this event is happening virtually, uh, we are all rooted in land. So I would like to begin by acknowledging that McMaster University is situated on the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe nations and within the lands protected by the dish with one spoon, one palm agreement. It is an agreement among all allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources of the Great Lakes region. For those who may not be familiar with this Canadian tradition, land acknowledgements are a way of recognizing the history and the contribution of our indigenous communities. The tradition of land acknowledgement has been reinforced by the Canadian Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was established to investigate the abuses suffered by Indigenous children and their families in the residential school system. Within the past month, several mass graves of Indigenous children who died in the residential school system have been discovered here in Canada reminding all of us that confronting atrocities through truth-seeking, victim-centered justice and reconciliation is a global issue. To move forward, every nation must confront the atrocities of the past. We honor the memory of these Aboriginal children. This conference is organized by the Center for Human Rights and Restorative Justice at McMaster University in collaboration with Illinois State University with the support of the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada. The Center for Human Rights and Restorative Justice here at McMaster is dedicated to the multidisciplinary and transnational study of human rights and restorative justice processes around the world. We aim to address historical atrocities and contemporary human rights violations from an academic policy and practitioner standpoint. The topic of justice for victims of contemporary human rights violations and historical injustices through national truth-seeking processes 
It's a central theme of this conference and a keynote that we'll be hearing shortly. In the past three decades, there's been a growth in transitional justice mechanisms aimed at redressing historical atrocities and present day human rights abuses. We see the growth in transitional justice measures in the global popularity of truth commissions from South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission to Canada's own residential school truth commission the Truth Commission model has become a popular mechanism for addressing issues of historical injustices, bringing about national dialogue, reconciliation, and peaceful coexistence in societies torn apart by egregious violence and collective trauma. Since the 1990s, over 50 Truth Commissions have been established around the world. The focus of truth commissions as transitional justice mechanisms has expanded to cover more types of violations, going beyond crimes against physical integrity, to examine a wide range of violations of economic, social, and cultural rights. Truth commissions are also becoming adept at capturing and addressing the abuses suffered by specific victim groups, including women, children, and indigenous people. We know, for instance, that national truth commissions have been established to investigate state repression, as in Chile. They have been deployed uh, as mechanisms for investigating racial injustice, as in South Africa, genocide, as in Rwanda, war crimes, as in South Korea, and state abuses, as in Morocco. Truth commissions have also been used in democratic transition processes as in Ghana and Kenya, and as a means of addressing government corruption as in the Philippines, and for addressing historical injustices against indigenous people as we see here in Canada. The focus of this conference and the keynote we'll be hearing about shortly is the place of storytelling in transitional justice processes. The growing popularity of truth commissions has coincided with the resurgence of memory politics and a period of increasing challenge to the nation state's hegemony over history. As official narratives are challenged by societal demands for accurate and truthful representations of the past, truth commissions and transitional justice processes generally have become public spaces for policing the boundaries of truth and falsehood, fact and opinion, the past and the present. The definition of transitional justice that frames this conference is a very broad one. It goes beyond the traditional reference to countries emerging from periods of conflict and repression, to address large scale or systematic human rights violations. Rather, we define truth commissions and transitional justice to include social historical transitions in countries seeking to address past injustices through truth seeking, collective acknowledgement and victim centered justice. This broader definition makes the Canadian, Australian, Chilean, uh, South African Truth Commission's integral part of the evolving models of transitional justice that we see around the world. And central to all these models is storytelling. Storytelling, the theme of this conference, is central to transitional justice processes. Stories are crucial to transitional justice work because they allow for the democratization of dreadful secrets, enabling difficult memories and buried knowledges to be excavated and shared in the public domain. While storytelling in truth commission work may allow victims, perpetrators and communities to construct collective memories of the past as a prelude to national repair, truth commissions and their focus on reconciliations have also been critiqued for fostering impunity, eroding human rights, trivializing violations, and failing to provide real justice to victims. 
Many of the papers at this conference examine these debates about truth commissions. It will also be part of the conversation in the keynote speech. We examine truth commissions and transitional processes as exercises in storytelling. The papers at this conference will address key questions in the field of transitional justice. What kinds of stories are told in truth commission hearings and other transitional justice processes? Who tells these stories and how are they recounted? Whose stories are amplified and whose stories are silenced? How does narrativization of transitional justice processes shape the outcomes and impact on state building projects? It all promises to be an exciting conversation that will start off with our keynote speech this morning. Once again, I thank you all for joining us today uh, for what really promises to be an exciting keynote and conference. Uh, the conference will start off with a keynote that uh, I know I'm looking forward to, and I know many of you are also looking forward to, from a very distinguished writer and public commentator uh, who has been thinking about these issues and writing about these issues for a very long time. Uh, I'm also proud to say that we have 52 participants uh, for the conference following the keynotes, and they're joining us from 15 countries around the world. Uh, we're delighted to have a distinguished keynote speaker. We are also honored and delighted to be joined by the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities at McMaster University, uh, Dr. Pamela Sweat, who's been, uh, a very, who's been very supportive of, of this initiative uh, to open this conference uh, with some brief remarks and introduce uh, our keynote speaker. I welcome Dr. Pamela Swift. Thank you very much, Bonnie. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here. Good morning to everyone. Uh, as Bonnie said, my name is Pamela Sweat. I'm Dean of the Faculty of Humanities uh, here at McMaster. And uh, as uh, I already said, I'm so pleased to be able to welcome you all to this virtual conference. Uh, well, I know we're all eager to get back to in-person meetings. Uh, at the same time, I feel there's a certain benefit to these online events. The ability to meet in a virtual space means we are able to have participants, as Bonnie said, from all over the world. Um, the last I heard was that we have people uh, zooming in from five different continents, uh, which I can only conclude will make the discussions and learnings over the next two days uh, more, more, more robust and uh, more varied in their perspectives. Although I do feel your pain if you're uh, zooming in from a significantly different time zone today. As an historian, I know how important narrative is to our understanding of the world and the events that affect our lives. Uh, conferences like this one are vitally important. We must always interrogate whose stories get told, uh, how these stories are shared and distributed as Bonnie just uh, laid out. Uh, we must also ask what roles stories have in helping or hindering the processes that can lead to justice following large scale conflicts or human rights violations. These questions are difficult and their answers are continually evolving, forcing us to be ever vigilant in their pursuit. And to that end, uh, I would like to introduce today's keynote speaker, Juan Gabriel Vasquez. Uh, he's a writer and journalist, as I'm sure many of you know, and is widely regarded as one of the most influential Latin American novelists working today. He's the author of seven novels, including the New York Times bestseller, The Sound of Things Falling, which won the 2014 International Impact Dublin Literary Award, and also the novel The Shape of the Ruins, which was shortlisted for the Man Booker International Prize. His novels have been published in 30 languages worldwide. Along with being a writer of fiction, short stories, literary essays, and political commentary, he is also a preeminent literary translator, translating works by Joseph Conrad, John Dos Passos, and Victor Hugo, among others, into Spanish. He has been awarded the Chevalier de l'Ordre des Arts et des Lettres by the French Minister of Culture and the Orden Isabel la Catolica by the King of Spain. It's a tremendous honor that he is with us here today. 
Please join me in welcoming Juan Gabriel Vasquez. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Boni Ibawo, for your warm words. And thank you, Dr. Pamela Suet, for your generous introduction. Thank you all, in fact, for being here wherever you are in our common virtual space. Um, it is a pleasure and an honor to be here at the Center for Human Rights and Restorative Justice. All those words, human and rights and restoration and justice, have been very much on my mind in recent years, and I feel privileged to um, share with you some thoughts about them. So let me begin with this statement. I'm a novelist. Um, over the past nine years, the nine tumultuous years, to say the least, since the announcement of the peace negotiations in my country, I have written dozens of articles and participated in countless um, events to try to support these efforts. But I have always done so as a citizen. And in the meantime, not a day has gone by that I haven't asked myself the same uncomfortable question. What is, at a time like this, the place of fiction? Um, in a society like mine, which is just now trying to come to terms with a recent history of incalculable suffering, what role can novels play? So the Colombian peace agreements, as you may recall, were the result of four years of negotiations between the government of President Juan Manuel Santos and the Marxist-Leninist FARC guerrillas. And the goal of the agreements was to seek a solution to half a century of war, a war whose true origins are lost in other, older kinds of violence, but in the course of which uh, Colombians have been left with um, a habit of horror. The peace negotiations managed to surprise us once again, because they brought with them unprecedented revelations uh, about a war that for many was happening elsewhere. And um, during the negotiations very soon, I realized that what was taking place in Havana, um, where the negotiations were set, um, what was taking place at the same time as the discussions about land reform or political participation was a narrative negotiation around two alarming questions. First, what happened in these 50 years? And second, who will have the right to tell it? I say these uh, questions are alarming because they involve political power, which is, as anyone knows, the ability to impose a story on society. In other words, in the process of negotiating the agreements, whoever is able to impose their version of our past will have an immense influence over the public life of the next generations. And I think it's no exaggeration to say that they will be able to shape it at will. The prize for whoever succeeds includes, for instance, the power to declare innocence and guilt in a decades old conflict, the power to decide who is the victim and who is the perpetrator, the power to define the terms of pain and the rules of revenge. There's a passage from Beloved by Toni Morrison uh, where a slave has an argument with his owner and although the slave is right, his owner brutally whips him. Lest he forget Morrison writes, that definitions belonged to the definers, not to the defined. Morrison would speak many years later uh, about how at the time of writing the novel, she discovered that the recorded history of America, the history as told by the definers, was not enough for her. And she had to appeal to the memory of her people as it had been 
inscribed, let's say, in the slave narratives, stories that had been silenced or buried, uh, the stories of the defined. The result is that Morrison's fictions have opened a space for a new past to exist or have allowed a past to exist that did not exist before. The reason for this is that the past, and here we enter swampy terrain, the past has a mysterious quality. It only exists as long as we tell it. The past, despite the tales of Borges and the novels of H.G. Wells, does not occupy its own physical space in the known universe. And this obviously presents an immense problem for all of us who want to know once and for all how things happened there, how people loved and hated and thought and killed and lived and died and suffered and rejoiced. Uh, this inability to know the past firsthand is, I think, one of our great shortcomings as a species. And from it derives our most acute frustrations. We feel, uh, we feel it as an amputation because the past, especially the violent past, the past that has hurt us, the past that has left in our existence the, the, the harsh and brutal emptiness of a violent death, that past never really passes. It is, it remains a dimension of our present. Faulkner, who could very well have been a Colombian writer, said it very well in Requiem for a Nun. He said, the past is not dead, it's not even past. And he's right, the past remains with us. It's a force that directs our lives, but we cannot see it until it takes the form of a story. A story, of course, that someone tells. There is no past without a story. There is no past, therefore, without a narrator. Therein lies the fragility of the past. That is why it is so vulnerable to fabrications, distortions, and lies. So after a quarter of a million dead and some eight million victims, the wounded, the displaced, the traumatized, the peace agreements in my country have closed one of our wars, but at the same time, they have opened up um, the obligation to find out what happened in it. Of course, much is at stake in the accuracy of these inquiries, in our ability to build with the discoveries that come out of the inquiries, a history of our collective past where we can all fit in. Every society, especially when it has seen itself descend to the levels of ferocity and cruelty that mine has experienced. Every society needs a story to put it back together again. Uh, this narrative is usually mm, sponsored by lofty words like healing or reconciliation, but often it is moved by a humbler objective, the illusion of looking at ourselves in the mirror without too much shame. I have spent the last 20 years learning to use the mysterious talents of the novel to get to the bottom of our endemic violence. And I have written some 2000 pages in the hope that fiction, fiction which is always more intelligent, more clairvoyant, more generous than the human being who writes it, um, in the hope I say that fiction will allow me a modest revelation about the deep reasons for that violence. But I have never ceased to be amazed by our capacity to hurt ourselves. About the South African case, Nelson Mandela once said, all of us as a nation that has newly found itself share in the same in the shame at the capacity of human beings of any race or language to be inhumane to other human beings. 
Colombians have felt that shame, though not all of them, uh, unfortunately. Um, they have felt it in recent months as the country has been confronted with the images of our horror that have been emerging in our new national conversation, the post-conflict conversation. We have learned about the ovens used by the paramilitaries of the Northeast to disappear the bodies of their victims. We have learned of the kidnapping and rape that um, were turned into systematic practices um, by the far guerrilla, uh, turned into just one more strategy of the armed revolution. And we learned the true dimensions of what we have called the false positives, the civilians killed by the Colombian army to pass them off as uh, combatants and thus collect individual benefits and enhance collective results. So faced with this abyss of degradation, the only thing that seems appropriate is the naked account of the facts and then a restrained silence. So what place? does the novel have there? I found Mandela's words in an essay published by Svetan Todorov in mid-2001, and I also found something else there. Todorov, of course, has written lucidly about the political manipulations of the past, but this essay was a meditation prompted by the publication of a series of books on the injustices committed in times of conflict, the ways of judging uh, those injustices and the institutions that our societies or fallible societies have designed to pursue post-conflict, the, uh, the values, the elusive values of truth and justice. In the essay, in the, in the middle of a broader uh, argument, Todorov dropped a, a passing insight that particularly caught my attention. He says, reparation for past injustices has been sought in three major ways. And then he goes on to explain those ways in a paragraph that I must quote in extenso. He writes, the first, the first way is in the law, in the judicial sphere, and it targets former criminals with punishments meted out by a tribunal charged with judging the past. The second is oriented toward the public life of the community and uses the instruments of politics and culture to address the victims, providing them with symbolic or material compensation. The third is aimed at the community as a whole with the goal of restoring the unity of a scarred society by establishing the truth about its past. The most notable, notable among its means, he continues, are commissions of inquiry, such as the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, and its field of application is communal memory. These different interventions in the name of justice also seem to have their continents of predilection. Continental Europe prefers yeah, legal this morning redress. in my time zone. The Anglo-Saxon world from Thank North you. America to New Zealand tends to opt for the compensation of victims. And Africa, Latin America and parts of Asia favor commissions of inquiry. This is the end of the very long quote. Of course, this, this theory of continental predilections has something of a playful generalization. And yet for me, as a citizen and a novelist uh, from Latin America, it points to a special relationship our societies have with, um, with the narratives that shape them. The Mexican historian Edmundo O'Gorman says somewhere that America was not discovered so much as invented. It was invented in the Chronicle of the Indies, for instance, where mermaids have the faces of men and the beaches are covered with black pearls. It was invented in Bernal Díaz del Castillo's La Verdadera Historia de la Conquista de la Nueva España, 
the true history of the conquest of New Hispania, where the Aztec capital is compared to uh, the wonders you read about in Amadis de Gaula, which is, of course, one of the chivalric novels that made poor Don Quixote go crazy. Those uh, stories of mythological creatures and utopian lands, remote ancestors of magical realism, obviously, would become the first draft of Latin American history. And uh, some four centuries later, when the Latin American novel came of age, one of the first challenges it took on was to confront uh, those definers to invent or discover a history of Latin America that contradicted or questioned the official histories inscribed almost without exception in the authoritarian, conservative, and Catholic institutions that ruled our societies. Those fictions, I'm thinking of 100 Years of Solitude, Conversation in the Cathedral by Mario Vargas Llosa, The Death of Artemio Cruz by Carlos Fuentes. Those fictions were an act of rebellion against certain narratives imposed from the different powers that shaped our perception of ourselves and often became national narratives much stronger and more encompassing than historiography. Henry Fielding reminds us in a page from Tom Jones that the Latin word invenire, to invent, means originally to discover. Latin American societies have always coexisted quite naturally with this act of creating the past in literature. And I think we would learn something important uh, if we could say why. I have a theory, but in order to explain it to you, I have to go back to 100 years of solitude and to an incident that occurred in my country four years ago. So in 2017, as my country was striving to overcome the divisions and the bitterness caused by the peace negotiations, a congresswoman from the right-wing opposition to the agreements, uh, notorious for her shamelessness, um, went on national radio to demonstrate why the relationship between politicians and the truth is so tense. She argued that the Massacre de las Bananeras, known in North America, I believe, as the Banana uh, Massacre, was nothing more than a historical myth created apparently by something called the communist narrative. So these are the facts. On December 6th, 1928, a group of Colombian workers of the United Fruit Company, an American company, went on strike to demand better working conditions. After several days came the repression by the Colombian army, during which an undetermined number of workers were killed. To say that the massacre uh, shaped the imagination of Gabriel Garcia Marquez is probably an understatement because he went to the extreme of uh, lying about his year of birth to make it coincide with the events. He was born in 1927, but claimed for some time that he had been born in 1928. Um, but the important thing is that the massacre so obsessed him that he placed it at the center of some of the best pages he ever wrote. This happens in chapter 15 of 100 years of solitude. Jose Arcadio Segundo has joined the strikers as they wait in the square across the station for a train to come in, a train in which the local military authority will arrive to mediate in the conflict, but nobody arrives. Instead, the workers and their families find themselves surrounded by snipers armed with machine guns and positioned all around the square. 
then an anonymous lieutenant calls for silence and a woman asks Jose Arcadio to carry her little boy on his shoulders so that he can hear the official decree. In the decree, a general by the name of Carlos Cortez Vargas declares the strikers to be a bunch of hoodlums, una cuadrilla de malhechores in the original, and authorizes the army to shoot to kill. The crowd is given five minutes to disperse. After four minutes have passed, someone shouts, cabrones, les regalamos el minuto que falta. The literal translation would be, you bastards, you can have the last minute on us, or something like that. But the great translator Gregory Rabassa, uh, responsible for 100 years of solitude, he cranks it up a notch. You bastard, uh, he writes, take the extra minute and stick it up your ass. The snipers open fire. Jose Arcadio II falls down and loses consciousness. And when he wakes up again, he finds himself on a silent train on top of a heap of corpses. He understands they will be thrown to the sea like rejected bananas. And so he jumps off the train and seeks refuge in Macondo. To the woman who uh, shelters him and offers him a cup of coffee, he says, there must have been 3,000 of them. And this is it. This is the line that um, awakens, shall we say, our Congresswoman's incredulity. That figure, 3,000, seems to her difficult to believe. And so she concludes that the massacre never happened. Um, and she adds, invulnerable to ridicule, that it was rather the workers who attacked the army. Um, in support of this, um, of her attempt at historical wiping, she concludes, you couldn't get the no that number of workers today. Historians in Colombia had to go out of their way to prove that the United Fruit Company was the size of a small town and that 3,000 workers would have been easily found. They proceeded, the same historians, to remind the lady, documents in hand, obviously, that the authorities stated officially that there were nine dead and three wounded, that General Carlos Cortez Vargas, the man responsible for the slaughter, confessed in his memories to 29 workers killed, that the Colombian press spoke of 100 dead and 238 wounded, that um, in 1929, the great Ricardo Rendon, a great cartoonist, drew the slaughter in a famous cartoon. And they finally remembered that the US ambassador in Colombia, Mr. Jefferson Caffrey, wrote to the Secretary of State in February 1929, these lines that seem to me irrevocable. He wrote, with reference to previous reports concerning the Santa Marta strike, and with special reference in that connection to my dispatch number 49 of December 29th, I have the honor to report that the Bogota representative of the United Food Company told me yesterday that the total number of strikers killed by the Colombian military exceeded 1,000. So yes, it is true that uh, there is no certainty about the number of workers killed on December the 6th, 1928. Historians are chronically used to these shady areas. For novelists, they are just the stuff that fiction is made of. Novalis famously said that novels arise out of the, short, arise out of the shortcomings of history. <clears throat> but to argue that the massacre did not happen does not belong to this order of uncertainty. It is a crude attempt to edit the past in a way that accommodates a political narrative of the present. 
Of course, 100 Years of Solitude, being the masterpiece that it is, foresaw the whole thing. And after Jose Arcadio II tells the woman about the shooting and the 3,000 dead, she looks at him in pity and says, there haven't been any dead here. Since the time of your uncle, the colonel, nothing has happened in Macondo. Garcia Marquez then writes, the official version repeated a thousand times and mangled out all over the country by every means of communication the government found at hand was finally accepted. There were no dead, the satisfied workers had gone back to their families and the banana company was suspending all activities until the rains stop. In the meantime, the rebels are hunted down and disappear. And Garcia Marquez describes it this way. During the day, he writes, the soldiers walked through the torrents in the streets with their pant legs rolled up, playing with boats with the children. At night, after taps, they knocked doors down with their rifle butts, hauled suspects out of their beds, and took them off on trips from which there was no return. Their families, the families of the disappeared, visit the commander's offices, hoping to learn some news. And the officer's answer is this, you must have been dreaming. Nothing has happened in Macondo, they say. Nothing has ever happened and nothing will ever happen. This is a happy town. 100 Years of Solitude was published in 1967 when our present conflict, the one we are trying to close now, was three years old, according to most accounts. But the metaphor it presents us has lost none of its pertinence. A year ago, uh, 11 months ago, Colombians were witnessing with uh, fascination, but also with disgust, the elaborate attempts coming from all corners of political life to disguise reality. While the former FARC denied one of their most obscene practices, the recruitment of minors, the political right downplayed the importance of the army's crimes, blaming a few bad apples for what would be revealed as a systematic practice once again that resulted in the perturbing figure of 6,402 victims. The persistence of these official lies and the proliferation of unanswered questions in times of what we have come to call post-conflict are as much a part of the painful legacy of war as the crimes themselves, and often represent a psychological wound capable of causing untold suffering. Anyone who has encountered the testimonies of victims knows the reparative effects of the simple fact of telling their stories, of seeing their suffering collected by an authority and receiving the recognition of the community. Post-conflict societies face several contradictions, but one of the most difficult um, is this, remembering the past and doing so uh, with accuracy and without censorship is the only way, is the, the only effective way to begin forgetting. This is uh, one of the paradoxes of violence. In order to forget the harm that has been done to us, our first task is to summon up the courage to remember it correctly. At the same time, evasions and denial and obfuscation um, and concealment and above all deliberate suppression that is all the mechanisms by which a society ignores the suffering of a human being. Mm. These mechanisms rob the victims of 
the minimum they need to begin healing. And since a civil conflict is first and foremost the confrontation of two or more ways of narrating the world, the establishment of a truth, a truth in which everyone can recognize themselves, becomes an indispensable requirement of any promise of reconciliation, however imperfect it may be. This is where the investigative commissions uh, that according to Todorov were favored by Latin American societies, this is where they become important. The Colombian peace agreements, of course, have created one of them. Uh, it's called La Comisión de la Verdad, the Truth Commission. And it's led by a decent man, if there ever was one in Colombia, Father Francisco de Rue, a philosopher and a Jesuit priest. Since 2016, the commission has undertaken the task of finding out as far as our imperfect knowledge allows the truth about the past. And soon they will have the unrewarding duty of telling us Colombians the results of their findings. I say that their duty is unrewarding because the story they produce will quite likely leave everyone unhappy. And this is precisely how we will know that they have done their job well. Just as no peace agreement uh, leaves everybody happy, no account of the war satisfies everyone. If it did, it would be a bad account of the war, a bad peace agreement. A few weeks ago, I spoke with Lucia Gonzalez, one of the 11 members of the Truth Commission. I wanted to know what she had discovered in these four years of investigations on the collective narrative of a country as broken as ours. The first thing Lucia did was to talk to me about our difficult relationship with memory. She said, it is a very important task. Uh, I'm not talking, she said, I'm not talking about the memory efforts made by the public institutions we have created. I'm referring to what has happened in the neighborhoods and in the communities. She said, today, five years after the signing of the agreements, it is very unusual to find a community that has not done an exercise in memory. And this is important, especially, she said, because higher up in those, um, among those who make the decisions, there are no such things. There are no attempts to recognize history among those who govern us. The difficulty, that we have now um, to open up a real dialogue comes from that too. And she concluded, it is very difficult to have a conversation with those who do not know history. Meanwhile, the commission has become a space where other dialogues are possible, where uh, important revelations come to light and uh, where uncomfortable truths become part of our collective knowledge. Only the most and cynicism has always uh, seemed understandable to me. It's a, it's a time-tested defense mechanism against extreme pain. But only the most cynical deny today how valuable it is for a torn society to see the perpetrators ask for forgiveness, to see the victims grant it or deny it, or even take refuge in a sovereign silence. So I return to my initial question. What is, in a time such as this, the place of fiction? In 2005, Nadine Gordimer gave a lecture about, among other things, the task of the novelists in times of conflict. She was 
discussing the world left to us after the 2001 attack on the World Trade Center and then the Atocha bombings in Madrid in 2004. Uh, and in that lecture, she asks how we should understand the role of writers uh, as witnesses um, when the image, TV cameras, for instance, or a photographic reportage dominates our perception of catastrophe, often making words superfluous or impotent. What does it mean that a writer can be a witness? Gordimer finds a line in the Oxford English Dictionary in which the state of witness is applied, she quotes, to inward testimony. The state of witness, she says, rather the Oxford English Dictionary says, is applied to inward testimony. This, says Gordimer, is what poetry and fiction do. And then she speaks of all the men, women and children, this is a quote, who have to reconcile within themselves the shattered certainties which are as much a casualty as the bodies under the rubble in New York, Madrid, and the dead in Afghanistan. That is the end of the quote. This is what she thinks would be the responsibility of the writer, to preserve and explore and illuminate the duality of inwardness and the outside world. So what does she mean? I have a theory. In the aftermath of any long and bloody conflict, such as the one my country has seen, the commissions of inquiry and the tribunals of transitional justice appear as places where a certain kind of narrative is produced leading to a certain kind of truth. But there are other kinds of truths, other types of knowledge that can only be reached through the language of fiction. The moral damage caused by uh, persistent violence to human, to human beings, um, the suffering and the degradation both of the victim and the perpetrator, mm, the psychological trauma, the concealed scars that are the legacy of uh, wars like these. These are all very real phenomena that can shape a life forever, but they frequently remain beyond the grasp of factual narratives, even those of the victims themselves. To recognize them, um, to understand them, to give them their due, we need an effort of imagination. Fiction, which uh, always strives to give shape and order to the chaos of human experience, also brings into view whole areas of that experience that would remain otherwise invisible. Fiction tutors or guides us in the complex interpretation of the lives of others. And also, I think, lends us the language to interpret our own world. One of the first consequences of violence is that we stop imagining others. I believe literature affords us a place where that imagination can happen once again. Let me go even further and say that the divisions plaguing my country today are the result, at least from where I stand, of a failure of the imagination. The deep rejection so many Colombians feel towards the peace negotiations and the resulting agreements can be explained in many ways, some uh, more justifiable than others, but it ultimately stems from um, an inability or a refusal to imagine 
to imagine the consequences of violence in the lives of those we don't see, those who are invisible to us, to imagine the consequences of the disappearance of violence, the transformations that briefly took place in those lives on the first days, let's say, after the, uh, the definitive ceasefire, to imagine, finally, the frustration and the anger now that the ghosts of violence are making them, themselves felt again. Chino Achebe loved the story of the aristocratic woman who traveling in her carriage one winter evening sees a poor boy shivering by the side of the road. She tells her coachman to remind her as soon as they get home to send the poor boy some warm things. And later, as she settles down in front of her own fire, the coachman mentions the boy and the lady says, oh, but it's nice and warm again. Let me finish by acknowledging the limitations of my trade, in spite of all that I have been saying. Novelists can become solemn or grandiloquent when discussing the impacts of what they do. And it is easy to forget how unnatural the bargain is by which our human lives provide literature with its material and only ask in return that literature helps us make sense of it. That being said, I do believe that a cruel conflict like the Colombian War presents great challenges to novels that are willing to accept them. One of those challenges is to create a space in which ordinary people can receive from a distracted society, a kind of protracted attention. A space in which the things that so many pretended not to see can be seen forever, happening again and again in words. A novel can be, in this sense, a place of resistance, not only against oblivion, but against denial, a, a kind of stubborn place in which the eyes of a society are always open, witnessing what often we'd rather not see, the, the ugly, the painful, the appalling. Literature affords us a place where these stories can be seen and interrogated, but also a place where these stories can see and interrogate us, the citizen readers, in ways that uh, are not always comfortable. The past, of course, is not a comfortable place, particularly after a long confrontation which has left durable wounds and a sense of disorder. Novels can be memorials where we pay homage to our dead and mausoleums where our dead can live through their words and through their stories. But they can also give shape and meaning to the past and uh, allow us to discover or to invent the truths we need to move forward into the uncertain future. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Um, that was uh, very inspiring and uh, very thought provoking. Uh, there was a lot uh, there to digest. I thank you very much, uh, Joanne, for that very uh, interesting and, and, and uh, soul stirring uh, reflection. Uh, we have some time for questions. Uh, so I encourage you to uh, use uh, the comment section. Okay, I see we already have one. So I will be moderating this session uh, with my colleague, uh, Dr. Paul Ugo, who's the literary experts and storytelling experts uh, uh, 
Uh, so, uh, but let us start with the one from um, uh, Tunde Abiru. Uh, and, and his question is, how do citizens put governments and institutions to task in the storytelling function, uh, in ensuring proper documentation of events, uh, that no doubt stories have to be told, you know, and, and all of that. But I think the essence of his question is how do citizens put government and institutions to task uh, in, in storytelling and fiction and in ensuring uh, proper documentation of these stories that you so well talked about? Yes. Yes, well, it's a great question. Of course, um, in our tradition, such as mine, and I think this is this is true for uh, for many places, many cultures. Mm, literature has always been the place where all the frustrations, all the discontents um, of mm, society filter down and sort of condense in the shape of a novel or a poem or a short story. This does not circulate, these stories do not circulate in the same way as mm, official narratives or um, accepted historical narratives. Mm, they work in very different ways. Ricardo Piglia, uh, an, a great Argentinian writer, who reflected very wisely on, on, on the place of stories in our societies, used to, um, used to ask people to think about a short story by Jorge Luis Borges called Shakespeare's Memory, in which, this is, what, this is the, the, the premise of the story, um, it sufficed for anybody to uh, say, I accept the memory of Shakespeare, uh, for them to be possessed, in a way, by the memory of Shakespeare. Not only the memory of having written Hamlet or Romeo and Juliet, but the memory of having been William Shakespeare, uh, married to such and such, um, and with such and such uh, sons and daughters. And Piglia said, if by a similar mechanism, we could say, I accept, all the stories that are circulating at any given moment in a society, we would have a more profound knowledge of that society than we would from any number of statistics or sociological um, uh, accounts, uh, or even historical accounts or journalistic accounts. The stories that we tell each other privately in a society are uh, in fact the, the um, they measure the pulse of a society. And this doesn't happen in our public narratives. Uh, the only places where they seem to happen, the only places that seem to be able to condense these private stories um, uh, are novels and short stories and poems, imaginative literature. Um, so what I mean to say is that they all, these stories travel through different, different, uh, canals, uh, shall we say, and they do different things and they're necessary because of different reasons. Mm, there are many things that uh, uh, history can do that novels cannot, but there are some things that novels can do that history or journalism cannot do because they happen in places that are unreachable for factual writing. <clears throat> this I think is what, what um, novelists should aspire to, um, as Milan Kundera says, to make the, to, to, uh, to say with novels what can only be said uh, in a novel. Um, that's a way of answering that question. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Juan. I, I really- Hello, Paul. I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. Um, you make a really compelling case for the centrality of literary imagination in processes of um, uh, uh, national reconciliation and healing. So thank you so much. Now, I, I see other questions, but I wanted to ask you one quick question before I take another one from, from the chat. 
uh, narratives in general, that is, is, as cultural representations are products of the imagination, right? It, it, it's fiction. But transition of justice as a political process is primarily concerned with legal testimony, right? So I guess my question to you then is, what is the place of literary imagination in a political process that is obsessed with legal testimony, right? Yeah. So I wonder yes. if you speak to that a bit. Yes, yes. Um, well, the, the, I think that one of the great conquests of, um, of the modern novel, let's say beginning with Don Quixote, is, is to open a space in which we don't judge, uh, in which the, the, um, the human passion for uh, judging and then condemning or absolving is left outside the boundaries of this, of this place. Um, uh, legal narratives in, in, in post-conflict uh, judicial systems uh, are supposed to judge, to establish innocence or guilt. Um, literature is the place, literature, particularly uh, novelistic imagination, um, says this is a place where we will, uh, we will try to uh, suspend judgment in favor of a very intense, almost dangerous kind of understanding. We try to understand the other, the enemy, uh, um, um, the one who is not like us. And uh, we do so through a process of identification that can be so intense as to uh, shake our values. Um, and this is, this is what is both, I think, useful and dangerous in, in novelistic imagination. Mm, real novels, novels, uh, um, novels that, uh, that are, as I said before, uh, smarter and, uh, and uh, more generous than novelists, mm, usually do not come out with a clear conclusion about anything, um, in, in particular in this case, about the, the, uh, the, the guilt or the innocence of uh, any character. Mm. Instead, they try to make us penetrate the reality of that character as despicable as he or she can be and uh, allow us for a certain uh, understanding, a very particular kind of understanding that does not happen elsewhere. Mm, I think this is what uh, Anton Chekhov, the, the short story writer, said when he uh, when he got a letter from um, from a critic who said that who berated him in a way because he didn't take a, a clear moral stance. Um, and uh, Anton Chekhov said, "The task of." The, the artist is not to answer the questions, but to formulate them correctly. I think this is what this is what novels try to do. They try to find the right questions to interrogate a society or an individual, and the answers to those questions happen elsewhere in tribunals, in commissions of truth, in those other in in history books, in great journalism. Um, but literature is content with finding the right questions to ask. Thank you, Juan. Um, I see a question from Tony Kerabira, and he says, how do we make sure the truth is not distorted in the novels or stories? And, and I'm reminded here of the case of Angie Clark in, in South Africa when she came out uh, with a novel about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And, and there were serious concerns that somehow she had tampered with the legal testimonies that had been provided before the commission. So I guess that's what Tony is asking here. Um, uh, how do we make sure that the truth 
that on rivals before truth commissions somehow um, is not distorted. In a novel. Um, well, this is, this is very tricky and I don't, I'm not familiar with the case that you're mentioning, but of course, mm, one of the great, one of the big problems with novels and one of the reasons novels um, can become uncomfortable uh, for, uh, uh, for societies and for the powerful, uh, for power institutions, um, is that novels are a, a no, the world of novels um, follows different rules, and uh, and it um, it it doesn't it part of what novels can do is distort distort reality um, for. Uh, in order to go to certain places, in order to present us with certain kind of truths, certain kinds of truth, I mean. Um, uh, there are novels, uh, for instance, who, which, um, which uh, overtly distort known facts about history. Mm, War and Peace, for instance, by Tolstoy, um, distorts chronologies uh, um, uh, and and uh, and contradicts contradicts historical facts um, uh, quite often. Mm. Of course, I can think also of novels in which a different kind of reality is set up quite willingly. Uh, novels which reflect, for instance, these are the most extreme cases, but it's just to, 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 to set some boundaries on, the, on this discussion. Um, they imagine what uh, would have happened in the United States if a Nazi regime had taken power. Mm, this, these are distortions of reality. These are distortions of fact. Uh, the only way to make a value judgment about them is to ask ourselves to what end are they changing what we know as truth? To what end are they distorting reality? Because many times, this is one of the great privileges of literature, many times we reach uh, through distortion we reach certain truths that do not belong to the realm of facts but that are very important human truths that we wouldn't have been able to think about if the novel followed known reality. Of course, um, uh, one of the great misunderstandings, I think, about magical realism is the idea that it builds in, in, in Latin American reality a world of pure fantasy. It doesn't. The, the, the great uh, talents of this way of looking at the world that Garcia Marquez made famous in 1967 with this, with this novel, is how closely it follows um, historical reality, but distorting it just a little bit to take us to a place that we have never been before and that affords us a knowledge of different things uh, or a knowledge of the same reality in a very new and productive and enriching, enriching way. So, uh, as I say, without being familiar with that case that you think is uh, underlies the question, I would think I would say that uh, one of the uh, one of the great privileges of the novel is to to distort reality, and we should judge them uh, depending on how successfully they use distortion to allow us um, a new kind of knowledge that we we wouldn't have been able to acquire um, otherwise. Yeah, thank you. I, I do absolutely agree with your answer. Uh, I mean, in your talk, you make a clear distinction between popular memory and official history. Official history itself is marked by distortion, right? So there's no yes. reason why we should give official history precedence over literary imagination because both of them depend on distortion, right? So exactly. There is another question here, and I think this is by Sarah Friedemann. 
Um, how do we get this rich stories to those most committed to keeping the violence going? And in brackets, she says, um, do they not tend to find their way to those already predisposed to the public, uh, to the public open to growth? Do they need to become films? I guess it's talking about possibilities of adaptations yeah. from literature to film. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes, she's absolutely right. And this is very bothersome for me. Um, I, had, I had this in mind when I started talking before during, uh, during the speech about the limits of what we do. Um, we're all very happy, novelists uh, uh, such as myself. We all have these wonderful ideas of what literature can do. But of course, for literature to do things, first it has to be read. And... Um, um, and and uh, it's not always uh, the case that that these very complicated systems of words and symbols and stories that are novels um, reach people who who would whose mindset can be slightly transformed by the reading. I I I, I don't have an answer. To this, um, but I do believe that over over time, uh, literature can suggest or uh, impulse a, a, a slight transformation of our relationship with 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 reality. Um, it may take time, and it may take uh, it certainly takes time, um, but I do think this this is this is a a space in which society, by which I mean uh, citizens, normal citizens, the everyman, um, they can in a way recover the right to tell their own stories from the hands of those who usually tell them. Um, I don't know how that happens, and I, I don't know how to make it happen more often. Yeah. And I'm not even sure that writers even uh, are 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 always right about what they what they present in novels. I'm sure. I'm, I'm, in fact, I'm sure they're not. Um, so it's a, a very good question for which, unfortunately, I have no answer. Okay, I, I think we can take one more answer uh, before we end the session. And this is by Anna. She, uh, she said, um, I found the ideas about the role of literary imagination and specific types of truth very fascinating. I was wondering though, what is the relationship between imagination and aesthetic here? Uh, can some types of truths be introduced in highly aestheticized nonfiction in a similar manner to novels or other genres of fiction? Yes, yes. Yes, that is, that is a very good question. Um, I, it's, it, it would be very difficult for me to explain it in, in five minutes uh, the, the different ways in which language and fiction works. Uh, um, differently from language in nonfiction. Mm, but uh, uh, I, I, I believe it's, it's not a question, if, if this is what you're suggesting, of um, a certain heightened style or, or a certain uh, uh, um, um, volonté de style, right? The, 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 the willingness to be demanding in terms of of um, the aesthetic component of writing, um, or the willing to be aware of the possibilities of, of technique and style, which is what great journalists anyway often do. Um, I think it's, it's more a question of that, that void that opens up when we go into the the very sophisticated agreement between a reader and a writer, uh, where when we say this didn't happen really, but we will pretend that it happened. And this opens 
a, a different relationship between the material of the story and the reader. It's different morally, it's different emotionally, it's different psychologically, because we are part of the idea of fiction. Fiction, uh, as you may know, uh, a long time ago in, in, in many languages, and I saw this in a book by, by Cotzia uh, lately, but this is something that I found in an old Spanish dictionary. Fiction used to mean to shape, to model, uh, and it was a, the, the word uh, fingere uh, used to mean, used to be associated with sculpture or, um, or wood carving. Um, fiction is also taking reality and giving it a particular kind of shape, a particular order. And these are aesthetic decisions. Um, and the, of course, and this is obviously a commonplace, but this is what defines what it can say. Um, a story says a different thing um, depending on the aesthetic material that is used to model it, to, sh to shape it. Um, um, yeah, well, I could go could go on for hours on this, but we don't have enough time. Thank you, uh, Anna, for your question. Thank you. Um, so we have just one minute left. I think that um, someone is supposed to give us a quick update on what's going to happen next, and, and Jennifer is going to do that. So once again, uh, thank you, Juan, for your very wonderful presentation. We really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. We're lucky to have you at thank this you. event.